I want to um, I want to read the text again. Um, Robert, if you can put it on the screen, uh, or if you if not, it's in your Bibles, Acts chapter nineteen, verses one and two. And you know there are Bibles in the pews in front of you for those who uh, have not noticed them, and most of you do. But there are Bibles in the pews. It's the New International Version. And because the New International Version is what's in the pew behind you, is what I'm, I'm using up here today. Amen? Amen. Amen? I'm going to read this in your hearing. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Not long after Paul arrived in Ephesus. He came across a number of men, and the Bible tells us in verse 7 that it was about 12 of them. Amen? Luke appears to have regarded them as Christians. He called them disciples in verse 1. And they are said to have believed in verse 2. However, they only knew the baptism of John the Baptist. Therefore, being baptized by John, as we're, we're told that they were, uh, they were John's disciples. Now, in the early days of the church, there were probably a number of cases where a clear distinction could not be drawn between the disciples of John, John the Baptist, and the disciples of Jesus. Now, with that being the case, Paul was encouraged to investigate the faith of these men, the disciples of John the Baptist. Amen? Are you with me? He asked, if you're with me, say amen. amen. Stay with me. He asked, therefore, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Verse 2. His criterion or his reason for what distinguished the Christian is significant. So, too, is the way he framed that question. It implies that the Holy Spirit, listen to me now, it implies that the Holy Spirit is received at a definite point in time, and that this time is the moment of initial belief. The same thought is expressed, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Having believed, you were marked in him, Christ, with a seal. With a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now I want you to notice this. Notice this. This seal is an indication of an orderly change in the believer's life. And you hear what I say? This seal is an indication of a change, an orderly change, in the believer's life. It's like a stamp or impression that displays the difference in your life and mine as a result of the Spirit within. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, again, Paul's question. He asked, have you received the Holy Spirit, Christian, since you believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now, as interesting and, and thought-provoking as that first question was to the other disciples, um, as some theologians have chosen to call them, they refer to them as those other disciples, <coughs> Equally interesting, however, is the answer they gave to Paul. Now, the Bible identifies them as such in the King James Version. They are identified as disciples 
whom Paul referred to as believers. Now, sufficient then is our understanding, according to Luke, that Paul recognized these brethren as not only believers, but also disciples that preached and taught according to the knowledge they had. Are you with me? Amen. Go with me in your Bibles, right? Go, go back to uh, one chapter, the chapter 18. Chapter 18. And uh, I, I want to read verse 24 in your hearing, okay? Uh, here we're going to find some background on one of those disciples, one such disciple as those that Paul encountered. Apollos was his name. Now, verse 24, chapter 8, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos. Can we get it up there? Okay, good. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. Now, the scriptures tell us that Apollos was a Jew born in Alexandria. Now, Alexandria was located on the north coast of the mouth of the Nile River. Okay? Everybody that's done history knows the Nile River know where it is, right? It was the second largest city in the Roman Empire. It was an important seaport and the empire, the Roman Empire's greatest cultural and educational center. Its library was world famous even way back then. Now, Apollos, without question, without a doubt in the world, was educated in his native Alexandria. He, he was eloquent, a great orator. He was a scholar and powerful in his use of Old Testament scripture, as was the case with many of those other disciples. And certainly now, being well versed in Old Testament scripture, he must have, at some point, as well as those others, come in contact with the term Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen? Perhaps, perhaps that's what prompted Paul to ask that question. Or perhaps Paul was not speaking under his own power. Maybe that which he spoke was from the spirit within him. Right. Mark chapter 13 verse 11 states that whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. It is very possible that the Spirit of God moved upon Paul to speak to these brethren, these Christians. Because although they were serious about their ministry, although they were powerful in speech and word, they were lacking the truths necessary for success in those efforts. Perhaps, perhaps God impressed it upon Paul to give them the rest of the story and to baptize them in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In any case, Paul's question came as an observation that moved the spirit within him. Here before him was a group of believers. Not only believers that witnessed, but spoke with a powerful and fervent, fervent, passionate spirit. They were passionate in their efforts for the cause of Christ. They were learned men, <clears throat> devoutly religious. However, there was something missing, according to Paul. And in my study of God's word, in my prayers to understand Paul in this instant, it came to me that there seems to be a great sense of urgency in Paul's words. Come on, Richard. It was a matter that desperately needed attending to. Twelve men, probably all were familiar with Apollos, <clears throat> maybe, maybe he even shared with them the lessons of John the Baptist, for all of them exhibited teachings by John. However, according to Paul, these believers, these Christians, these folks who are powerful in word and deed, these preachers of the gospel, had not yet received the Holy Spirit. Somebody ought to say Amen. Paul asked another question on the heels of their answer, just as interesting as the first. Into what then were you baptized? Into what then were you baptized? With that question, also with terms of tones of urgency, 
Paul felt that those believers, those Christians, with desire but no presence of the Holy Spirit could become a danger to the Christian movement. Perhaps he thought of himself prior to his Damascus Road experience. Paul, then Saul, was very religious. God fearing. If you will recall, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a member of the great Sanhedrin, in good standing with the church. Highly educated, eloquent, a great orator. Yet to those that did not believe as he believed, he became a persecutor. If you're not going to say amen, they'll say, oh my goodness. <laughs> this very religious man, this man of God, would drag men and women in chains before the religious court, the church, and its leaders to be tried and sometimes executed. Did you hear what I said? You should say it again. Oh my goodness. Desire, eloquence, and great oratorical skills were all welcomed by Paul. Thank you, man. Thank you. I said earlier that I loved Ben, right? I meant every word of it. Desire, eloquence, great oratorical skills. They were all welcomed by Paul as long as the individuals were filled with the Holy Spirit, as long as they were spiritual Christians. As long as they were what? As far as Paul was concerned, the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life is what distinguished the Christian from everybody else. I'm going to say that again. I'm going to say that again. As far as Paul was concerned, the thing that distinguished the Christian from everybody else was the Holy Spirit in the life. Amen. That's the difference. That's the difference between us and everybody else. Now, now, there are those that lack a clear understanding of what distinguishes God's spirit in the life from that other spirit. Understanding this dilemma, our prophetess, Ellen White, in writing on the life of the, of the spirit in the life of the Christian in her book, Acts of the Apostles, and that's page 51, she clarified, excuse me, any misunderstandings when she stated clearly in plain language it is not a conclusive or, in other words, it would be undeniable evidence that a person is a Christian because he or she manifests spiritual ecstasy or joy or excitement under extraordinary circumstances. Holiness, she said, is not rapture. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It is an entire surrender of the will of God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God in trial and darkness as well as in the light. It is walking by faith and not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence and resting in His love. That's what holiness is. That's what holiness is. Brother, listen, listen. Brother Grant, and if you repeat this, you tell him Brother Grant said this. Brother Grant said this. As far as I am concerned, and I'm convinced of this, uh, that Paul, so far as he was concerned, if, if any good thing comes out of us, it is not because of anything that we have done, but because of what God is doing in us. And that which God is doing is enhanced by the presence of his Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. Amen. Thank you. The presence of God's Spirit, it brings about a change in the life and ministry of the Christian. Everybody should have said amen. amen. The presence of God's Spirit brings about a change in the life and ministry of every Christian. 
that there are many well-intended Christians in the world, but their lack of the Holy Spirit reveals that the change is incomplete. The songwriter said it well. You know the song. He said it well. He said, I have all the outward appearances of a Christian, but there is something missing on the inside. There should be a change, a difference, not just in knowledge or fashion, but in heart and spirit and ministry and fellowship. Thank you. I know what he was talking about. I know what he was talking about. Peter followed Jesus. He loved Jesus. He truly believed that Jesus was the Christ. He said so. Jesus is the Son of God. 24 hours a day. Peter was in the presence of Jesus, side by side, eating with him, sharing with him. He was always in his presence. However, the presence of Jesus was not in Peter. The Holy Spirit was not in Peter. You remember? When Jesus began to share his passion, his death and resurrection, with his disciples in, in uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 20, 23, Peter rebuked him. He just said, no, 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 this, this is not going to happen to you. The presence of God was not in him. And Jesus verified it when he said, get away from me, Satan. You're an obstacle in my way. These thoughts of yours, Peter, these thoughts of yours, if you would allow me. These thoughts of yours, Peter, perhaps this gossiping, this backbiting, this slander, this lying, these persecutions, these character assassinations, they don't come from God, but from man. Get away from me, Peter. In other words, Peter, that presence in you, that form of godliness, that pretentious behavior is not God, Put up the devil. Ellen White. Ellen White, when writing about this difficult time in the earthly ministry of Jesus, she said that when he gave the promise of the Spirit, he was standing in the shadow of the cross with a full realization of the load of guilt that was to rest upon him as the sin bearer. Before offering himself as a sacrificial lamb, he instructed his disciples regarding the Holy Spirit, the most essential and complete gift which he was to bestow upon his followers, the gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of his grace. Acts of Apostles, page 47. She was talking about us as well, not just those disciples, but us. The Holy Spirit is a gift to us. I was sharing with my class this morning. I was sharing with my class this morning. We have a discipleship class in the back there. And today we were literally talking about uh, the Holy Trinity. And, and we focused somewhat in the last, uh, last few paragraphs on the Holy Spirit. You do know that the Holy Spirit is a gift to all of us. Is that right? Do you know that? Come on, everybody. I I'm telling you right now if you didn't know it. Everybody. The Holy Spirit is a gift to all of us. Somebody say amen. Amen. It is a gift to all of us. And, the, and, and we learn this morning, we learn this morning that the Holy Spirit is the one that gives us our spiritual gifts. Did you know that? Yes. We learn this morning that the power that God moves within each of us is a result of the Holy Spirit in each of us. So what does that tell us? That we can do all things through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us power. Anything that you ask Jesus for, in faith, believing, the Holy Spirit will make it possible. Amen. Do you know that when Jesus left this world, he said, I'm going to send you a comforter. Meet the Holy Spirit. You know that, right? Yes. To be with you always. To comfort you. And not only that, to help you in your ministry for the cause of Christ in this world. Amen. Did you know that? Yes. We have access to the greatest power in the universe, the Holy Spirit. And through him, we can do all things. Yes. Brethren, oh, I 
will pray the Father, Jesus said, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not but, and knoweth him not, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. John 14, 16, and 17. Brother, listen, Brother Grant understands the magnitude of what has happened here, okay? Of what has taken place in the life of the Christian. God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, am I right? Yeah. It has given to his disciples, that includes you and I, God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, am I right? To abide with us forever, giving us access to the first person of God, God the Father, am I right? Yes. Always. Did you, did you get that? When, when, I, when I say, did you understand what I said? Because of Christ, because of what he's done, we have access to the Holy Spirit, which gives us access to who? Jesus. God. God the Father. I was just trying to see if you were listening. You, maybe you didn't get it. Is Brother Grant going too fast, or is, he, is, or is he doing this unintelligently so you can't understand it? Listen, it, because of what Jesus has done, we have access to the Holy Spirit who gives us access to who? God. This is, this is probably the most important thing that we as Christians need to know. Because of what Jesus has done, we have access to the Father. Amen. I understand. I understand that. I understand that it is possible for me to love my neighbor as myself. Because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in me, I, I understand that it's possible for me to love my neighbor as myself. It doesn't matter what he's done. It, it doesn't matter whether he's a thief or a robber. It doesn't matter whether he is an adulterer or a cheater. It doesn't matter if he's a liar. Because of what the Holy Spirit has done for me, I can love my neighbor as myself. Did you know that? Because God has asked me to be a spiritual person. Do you remember over in Mark, Mark chapter 10, beginning around verse 32? You remember what uh, James, the, the, the uh, exchange that Jesus had with James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John? Do you remember that? Anybody remember that? Raise your hand. I'm trying to do this, Lord. I'm trying to do it. James and his brother John came to Jesus. And they obviously believe that he's coming into his kingdom. And they said, Lord, it's grant that one of us will sit on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your glory. You remember that? And, and Jesus said to them, you, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you're asking. He says, can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized? Now, let me, let me just give you a little, a little history here. In the Old Testament, when they spoke about the cup and its wine and so forth, uh, what it was, it was an illustration of suffering, okay? And we know that when Jesus spoke to his disciples, he spoke with them in terms that they can understand. So he was telling them, he was saying to them, can you endure the suffering that I'm going to suffer? And then with baptism, when they talked about baptism, they talked about a deluge, you know? Uh, baptism represented a, a very powerful flood that was coming upon everyone, okay? A very powerful flood. And so he was saying, you know, uh, can, you, can you endure the suffering that I am going to endure, and, and can you, you think you can make it through the flood that's coming against me? Now, this happened, they, this exchange happened just after he had told them, I'm on my way to Jerusalem, and when I get there, you know, they're going to beat me, they're going to spit on me, they're going to they're gonna whip me, and, and they're going to torture me, and then they're going to kill me. So he said, do you think that you're spiritual enough? This is what he was saying. Do you think that you're spiritual enough to endure what I am going to endure? Do you think that you're spiritual enough to handle it? This is what he was saying to him. This is what he was saying to him. He says, I am here to die for sinners. 
It, and he didn't specify, no, I don't mean murderers. I don't mean robbers. I don't mean thieves. I don't mean liars. I don't mean cheaters. No, 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 no. For everybody. And he said, if you think you are, do you think you're spiritual enough to do the very same thing? To love your neighbor as yourself? I don't care what he's done. <laughs> to pray for him. We pray for our neighbor. Doesn't matter what he don't, doesn't matter what kind of neighbor he is, liar, thief, murderer, robber, doesn't matter. We pray for him. You understand? What we forgive him. We pray that God will change him in such a way that he'll come to know and love God and Jesus the way we know and love God and Jesus. So I understand. I, I understand that it is possible for me to love my neighbor as myself. I understand that it is possible for me to bless those who curse me. Huh? I understand that it is possible for me to do good to those who hate me and to pray for those who spitefully use and persecute me. That's what it means to be spiritual. Do you understand what I'm saying? I understand that in spite of the fact that I live in an imperfect world, that I can be perfect as my Father in heaven is and as Jesus is, that I can do that which Jesus did and even greater things yet because of God's spirit that is in me. I understand that the power Jesus welded is available to me because of the spirit within me. Because of that presence, I can do all things through Christ who empowers me. I now know, brethren, I now know that there is a power in the presence. I now know that there is a power in the presence of God. When the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples of Christ at Pentecost, 3,000 souls were led to Christ in a day. And Peter, Peter was the preacher. Peter was the preacher. In Acts 2.43, we find that many miracles were being done through the apostles. One day, Peter and John went to the temple at 3 o'clock. What time? Prayer time, to pray. There was a man there at the gate, beautiful, who had been lame all his life. Every day he sat at the gate begging people for money. He saw Peter and John and he did not change a thing. He asked them for money. Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I to thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. You and I can do the same thing. This is what I've been trying to tell you in the last few weeks. It's what being a disciple is all about. The same power that Jesus exercised through those disciples, he can exercise through us. We simply have to get to the point where our relationship mirrors the relationship that they had with him. It's what I've been trying to tell you. Well, that's what God's been trying to tell you through me. I've got nothing to tell anybody. But God has a whole lot, and for some reason he uses us up here to do it. So this is what he's been trying to tell you. <coughs> this is who you are. You're not ordinary people. No. There's nothing ordinary about you. No. There's nothing ordinary about the Christian. No. There's a power in you that you cannot believe in. God is waiting to exercise it through you. He just wants the relationship to become of such that he knows he can trust you. Amen. That's all of us. That's all of us. I, the Bible says that Peter took that young man by the hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. He went into the temple, leaping and praising God. I'm telling you, brother, there is power in the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. Amen. Peter was so filled with God's Spirit that if the people knew he would be passing by, they would cast their sick in his shadow and the injured on mats and beds, hoping that that shadow would fall on them as he passed by. People from all over, all over Jerusalem, they came bringing their sick and possessed with evil spirits to be healed. Threw them into Peter's shadow and they were all healed. They all became strong again. The lame began to walk, the blind began to see. The disease left them, the demons left them. We serve the same God that gave Peter that kind of power. Amen. We serve the same God. There is nothing that we can't do once we realize that. 
Once our relationship gets to the point where we recognize that the same God that they serve then is the same God that we serve today. Amen. Saul was on his way to Damascus. Saul was on his way to Damascus to drag the Christians back for trial and possible execution when he met Jesus. He became so filled with God's spirit that a few days after he arrived, instead of dragging folks back for trial, he was preaching Jesus to them. The persecutor had become a preacher. There was hope for us, man. Let me tell you, there's hope for us. There was hope for us if we just believe. We just believe. We just believe. I was telling my class this morning, I was telling my class that I, I thank God so much for the relationship that he and I have. I pray to him every day. And, uh, and, and you don't have to take my word for it, you know. Ask my uh, prayer partner. Um, ask my wife. I pray every day. And you want to know what part of my prayer is? Lord, please give me a triple portion of your spirit. Amen. Every day, Lord, give me a portion of your spirit. Yes. Help me to become more like you. Amen. Help me, Lord, to develop such a relationship with you that you will know that you can trust me. Yes. That you will, your, 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 your spirit will impact my life in such a way that everyone that I'm around will be impacted by what you've done in my life. Amen. Pray to God for the Holy Spirit in your life. Pray every day. Ask him to make you everything that he wants you to be. To help you so that your relationship will be of such that everybody looking at you will want to know and love the Jesus that you know and love. Amen. There was something. There was something lacking in those other disciples that we talked about. But it was not the desire to know more about Christ. When we look at the situation further, when we examine it further, we find that when Paul explained what they were missing to them, they readily accepted and was baptized in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, everybody say amen. amen. Verse 6 said that when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in other languages and prophesied. I'm telling you, brother, there's power in the presence. There's power in the Holy Spirit. And I want to do something here today, you know? Just what I've encouraged you to do. I want to pray that God's Holy Spirit will come upon each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. If, if you want to come down here, I encourage you to come down here so that you can, you, you can hear this prayer right here. You'll be right here. I'm going to ask for God's Holy Spirit to come upon you. Don't be, come on down here. Come on down. I know you are here this morning because you want that same relationship that they had. Amen. You, want the, you, you want the same God that they know and love and, and the, the power that he gave them to, to come upon you. There is nothing that God can't do through his people. Amen. Let me tell you something. You know God don't need us, right? That's right. Yeah. You, you understand? Everything he want to do, he can do. But the same reason that he sent his son to die for us is the reason that he wants to use us today. Yeah. He sent his son to die for sinners because he loves us. And that's the reason he wants to use us to go out and tell others about him and lead them back. Because he still loves us. He still loves us. He will never stop. The great God of the universe sent his son to die for sinners. And he wants us to have the attitude that we are not ashamed to do the same thing. Yeah. Do you know many of the disciples that walked with Jesus, you know, were, were, were crucified, beheaded? They were killed. You know why they were killed? Because of the same gospel that Jesus was preaching. The same gospel we're preaching today. Bow your head with me. And those of you in, back, in your seats, bow your head with me as well. Father in heaven, eternal God, blessed Savior. Oh dear God, oh dear God. I know you love us, Lord. I know what you did in sending your son for us. I understand it now, Father. I, I know, Father, why you have him even now, Lord, in your kingdom, interceding on our behalf because you love us, dear God. And I know why you have us here, dear Lord, because you want us to live the same life that he lived in such a way that others will come to know and love you as well. 
Father, everyone sitting here in the pews today, dear Father, everyone standing here this morning, Lord, I am interceding for and I am begging, I am pleading you and with you in the name of Jesus. Pour out a triple portion of your spirit upon each one of us. Fill us with your spirit, dear God, in such a way that our lives will become everything that you want it to be. And by your grace, dear Father, all of those who see us, Lord, will come to know and love you because of what they see in us. I thank you. I praise you, dear God. I give you all the glory for who you are and what you're doing in each of our lives. Help us to get to that point, dear Lord, where our relationship with you, dear Father, will be of such that you know you can trust us. Amen. That you know that, dear Father, that you can give us a responsibility that, and knowing that we're going to carry it out, dear God. And by your grace, your kingdom will be represented in this world. Amen. I thank you. I praise you. I give you all the glory, dear Father, for who you are. In the name of your son, Jesus, and for his sake, let everybody say Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You may bless.